I've been a steelhead fisherman in Washington since 1955. I was um, raised on the lower Columbia River and began fishing on the Washoka River. Um, and steelhead have been, um, I guess, suppose, other than my family, uh, the next major part of my life. Uh, this is a historic picture of the Skagit River. Uh, what I'm going to cover are Skagit wild hatchery steelhead harvest history, wildlife history changes, and northwest comparisons in other areas. This is a Skagit River catch by uh, apparently three anglers. Uh, there's one rod there, uh, there's one rod there, and there's one rod there. Presumably the photographer was the third fisherman. Uh, this was from a photo studio in Cedro Woolley. Uh, 18 steelhead among three fishermen. Uh, pretty good day. Uh, sense of humor among them. Uh, here you can see in his hand is a little fish too. And so he's got uh, probably a, uh, a bull trout or maybe at that time p potentially even Dolly Varden at that time. Anyway, pretty impressive catch. I'll provide a description of the um, Skagit Hatchery Program as it was described in the 2004 Lower Skagit Acclamation Pond Draft Environmental Impact Statement by Washington Department of Fish and Wildlife. Primary purpose of stocking Chambers Creek Hatchery Steelhead in the Skagit Basin is to provide high harvest on early returning hatchery fish prior to the arrival of wild steelhead and to minimize interbreeding between naturally spawning and, hatch and hatchery steelhead and wild, naturally spawning hatchery steelhead and wild fish. Um, here a little explanation as regards the different types of hatchery programs that have been used over the years. Uh, this is called an isolated, supposedly an isolated hatchery program. There are supposedly integrated hatchery programs using wild broodstock and um, there are captive broodstock in which the fish are kept um, in fresh water and used for rearing at that point for smolt releases. Uh, in actuality, um, the isolative concept is uh, mythology. There is absolutely no way that you can isolate um, hatchery steelhead from spawning with wild because of the breadth of time that wild steelhead can spawn. Um, so probably the more accurate um, description of um, the so-called isolated program is called a highly domesticated hatchery program. To provide more steelhead harvest in the Skagit Basin, a management decision was made to increase hatchery smolt releases by 115% from a pre-1992 average of 248,000 to the proposed level of 534,000 thereafter. So let's take a look at this history, put it into context. I know of only one real evaluation that occurred of the hatchery program on the Skagit River um, prior to fairly recent history. That was done by Lloyd Royal uh, in 1972. He not only analyzed the Skagit, but a number of Puget Sound streams. Um, essentially, the message that you can see, even in the first 10 years of the program on the Skagit, when he did the analysis, is essentially the more spolt you plant, the less harvest. This is during the glory days, supposedly, of the 1960s to early 1970s, uh, when things were supposed to be working pretty smoothly. The dark bars at the bottom are harvest. The gray bars are number of smolts released. And the red lines um, enclosing the white bars um, are the number of smolts planted to produce one harvested steelhead and includes both hatchery and wild. So it increasingly takes more smolts plant in order to produce a harvested fish. Um, again, a, a reminder, this is in the first 10 years of the hatchery program. This is, uh, take a look at it from a little longer perspective of uh, more than the uh, first 10 years. Here is the period of time that Lloyd Royal was examining it. A lot of folks uh, during those early years uh, got focused on these high points. 
What really tells the story is the low points, tells you the more accurate. What you can predict over time is to look how they fail, not how they succeed. This is the long-term consequences over the entire period of time from the supposedly glory era of the 1960s of the early hatchery days to the present. This is harvest, combined hatchery and wild, combined uh, sport and tribal. Tribal harvest is the darker, sport harvest is the lighter. There's very little record of any tribal harvest history in the early years. After the Bolt decision, there was a bit of, uh, art, uh, bit of uh, sort of uh, harvest competition to um, claim turf uh, on developing the 50-50 percentages. After a while, it got pretty well hammered out, and from here on, if anything, here in the latter part, uh, the tribal harvest has actually been somewhat less than 50% most of the time. So we can't blame the tribes for what's happened. We're all part of the problem. There's the hatchery smoke plants. Harvest. The more you plant, the less you harvest. Same as the 1960s, 70s. So let's take another view of it. This is the... Uh, the blue line is the wild steelhead trend as regards run sizes. The red line is the hatchery steelhead trend during the period from 1978 to near the present. Small plants escalating. Wild fish are doing bad enough. Hatchery fish doing much worse. Hatchery trend line pointing to zero. And that's where we're going, zero harvest. That's the name of the story. This is where the hatchery program has been taking us and it's dragging these guys right down with them. During better ocean conditions, hatchery fish do pretty well. When you start to get into inclement ocean conditions or inclement freshwater conditions, hatchery fish just do not have the same survival rates. And they pass this characteristic on to the wild population through interbreeding on the spawning beds and we'll go into that a little later. In a second part of a program I'll give later. Here's a history, the South Tacoma Hatchery Chambers Creek Steelhead story. These were a couple of graphs that were included in a uh, very good paper uh, report that came out Department of Fish and Wild, uh, Department of Wild, uh, Wildlife that time in 1992, showing the Chambers Creek Hatchery program. It was definitely having difficulties at that time. This is um, the return rates Again, look at this, it's, uh, oftentimes we get mesmerized by the high points. We like the good news, this is what we like to base management on. Unfortunately, we've had a history of just looking at this rather than looking at the low points to tell the truer story. Um, the solution of this decline, well, plant more. Results? Chambers Creek steelhead went extinct in Chambers Creek. They exist no more. This is the oldest um, hatchery steelhead program, continuous hatchery steelhead program in the state. It originated actually in the 1920s. We have data that goes back to the early uh, 1950s. The only reason I found out about this, my assumption was Chambers Creek hatchery steelhead were still around and doing okay, reason unknown to any of the public, and actually unknown to most, uh, a lot of people at least, even with part, within the Department of Fish and Wildlife, is that Chambers Creek steelhead went extinct in 19, 1997. It couldn't even sustain itself, given the protection of Chambers Creek with no harvest at all. So right next to Chambers Creek is the Nisqually River. A lot of people like to point to Nisqually and they say, well, look, you've got bad habitat conditions, you've got a habitat problem. You stopped hatchery winter run steelhead plants back here and the fish still went to hell. So it won't do any good. Well, that wasn't exactly the story. I actually began to look at the data on, on Nisqually River and there's a number of 
hatchery release years that are apparently missing. This period to this period, there's no record of hatchery fish being planted of winter run steelhead, but there's a definite record of hatchery harvest, where they come from. So uh, I also began to put together, a lot of people uh, tend to look only at the hatchery winter steelhead plants in the Nisqually. They forget about the summer steelhead plants. The summer steelhead plants continued right to here. My argument for the Nisqually is, rather than it being a demonstration of uh, not being a success story for eliminating the hatchery plants, but rather it is a success story. Take the example, like we just showed, right next door, hatchery fish went extinct, stop the hatchery program, you stop the bleeding. They leveled out. So the good news is Nisqually steelhead did not go extinct. If we had continued this, Nisqually steelhead could well be at tiny little remnant levels down here. Okay, here's the story, repeated over, smolts red line, harvest blue line. Pretty simple story. So let's look at that management results in the Skagit River. Skagit River still had harvest in 1951 <laughs> to 60, averaged 15,000 nearly all wild. The 2001 to 2010 combined harvest of wild and hatchery steelhead averaged 1,500. This loss coincides with a 1994-2007 average of 450,000 hatchery steelhead smokes <coughs> planted annually in the Skagit, 6,235,000 total. At $1 per hatchery smolt, a minimum cost, 6.23 million was spent in 14 years with resulting 90% loss of harvest once provided by wild steelhead 50 years ago. There is an alternative. The North Fork Umpqua River has been managed um, with minimal attempts to try hatchery winter run steelhead uh, um, uh, smolt releases. There were uh, occasional uh, one to three year periods back in here and back in here where they were attempted and uh, small plants and uh, did not result in many returns. So they went back to relying on wild fish. This is a similar period of time. This is a Winchester Dam counts uh, on the uh, North Fork Umpqua River. Over time, you can see the ocean condition changes throughout. The fish come right back up, dead level, throughout 64 years shown on this graph. Sport harvest, dead level. The only reason these are down here is because the anglers on the North Fork Umpqua were uh, lobbying uh, Oregon Department of Fish and Wildlife. They wanted some more catch and release seasons, so that dropped the harvest back. It's not that it was unsustainable. It was sustainable and continues to be sustainable. Management results. North Umpqua River, wild winter runs of steelhead without hatchery winter plants have remained stable for 64 years with a return average of 71 uh, uh, 7,150 wild steelhead per year. Steelhead harvest has been similarly stable at 1,200 steelhead per year for 40 years. This record of sustainability has come at no public cost. Some folks say, well, the reason the North Fork Umpqua has got a lot better habitat and that uh, Puget Sound has just been ripped to hell. There's no more habitat left in Puget Sound. What are you arguing about? This is a... Um, Overall watershed ratings that were done by the Flathead Lake Biological Station, the University of Montana, which occurred over uh, 1,600 river basins in the uh, North Pacific Rim from Kamchatka uh, to Southern California. The lowest number at this far end is the highest rated habitat. So we're talking here 1,600 rivers at this, just a fairly small sample size of the, six, of, of, of the 1,600 total. Just to give you an idea, Elwha down here, of course, the upper watershed, all being Olympic Park, what John was referring to as the lower Elwha uh, of the lower five miles, which again are certainly very degraded. Anyway, the Elwha is down here at about uh, 100, and uh, so it's the 100th ranked among 1,600. 
The Skagit is about 300. The Umpqua is about 600. So habitat watershed assessment does not explain the uh, North Umpqua wild steelhead resiliency over that of the Skagit. Oh, one more thing. Beachy et al. 2006 did a Skagit Basin spawner habitat capacity analysis and found that there was sufficient spawning gravel available in the Skagit Basin to support uh, 300,000 Chinook salmon. So let's look at this supposedly degraded habitat of the Skagit Basin. Cascade River. Cascade River has many miles of pristine habitat, today nearly void of a wild winter steelhead. Some of us who did some of the collections in the Skagit Basin uh, for the um, SK report, the Skagit SK report, put considerable effort into trying to make collections in the, in the Cascade River and were unable to come anywhere close to meeting the number of the sample size needed for a good genetic analysis of adult fish returning. Yet, you've got habitat like this. Again, Beachy et al., 2006. Present spawner capacity, 9,000 Chinook. There's some exceptional gravel. Spawner capacity doesn't tell you everything. There's rearing capacity as well. But the Cascade River has many miles of beautiful uh, boulder, riffle, pocket water habitat that should be ideally suited to high steelhead rearing productivity. Wild steelhead life history shifts before and after the modern hatchery programs. So, here's again that, like Rich showed that uh, remarkable year, 1971. Throughout the state, a number of big steelhead caught that year. Anyway, here's the run timing shifts that have occurred. The red bars indicate the sport catch in the winter years of 1955 and again 1956. This is the sport catch in the Skagit Basin at that time uh, reported on punch cards. 60% were early return between December and February reported on punch cards. 40% were late return between March and April. As an example of what that early return component included, Here's a near 20 pound steelhead caught January 25th, 1959. Already significant spawning color, very mature fish. This was caught near Rockport by a fly fisherman. This uh, particular mount is at Western Washington University in their uh, historic archives. Here is uh, again the uh, one steelhead of the two 30 pounders in the Skagit Basin that uh, uh, Rich showed earlier. This is the 30-pound, uh, two-ounce gadget steelhead caught January 1st, 1971. Obviously, those early return steelhead included some big critters in a moment. Unfortunately, we don't have historic tribal catch in the Skagit Basin, but we do have in uh, three other river basins in Puget Sound. They pretty much tell the same story as the Nisqually. Tribal catch, 97% early return. Late catch, 3%. By contrast, sport catch in Nisqually is very similar to Skagit. 57% early, 43% late. Why the difference? Number one, tribal fisheries are low in the watershed. Sport fisheries occur throughout the watershed, right up to the spawning grounds. Secondly, during this period of time is when we get the most inclement water conditions for sport fishing with a lot of turbid water. It makes it difficult to be very good at harvesting steelhead with sport gear in turbid water conditions. By contrast, it's ideal for nets. So you do very well during those same conditions. During clear water periods is ideal for the sport fisher. Latter part of the season, 
sport fishermen do very well, plus they're fishing right up to the spawning grounds. So somewhere between these two is probably the reality of what the um, historic run timing was. This was uh, 1935 to 1959, well before the uh, modern hatchery program. This as well. So how has this affected us as fishermen, whether you're a tribal fisherman or whether you're a sport fisherman? And uh, for sport fishing, this is Ralph Rawls steelhead catch data that's at the historic archives at Western Washington University, all in his journals, carefully kept just as he kept his log books at his department store in Bellingham. Early return catch by Ralph Wall in this period of time, 1936, 1955, 51% early, 49% late. Look at this part. Back then when there were year round, still had opportunity to schedule the system, 40% of his catch was summer run, 60% winter. This is my catch. Similar numbers of fish, but in here you have to remember that I live on the river and I can fish it daily and during a period of time, I also was contracted to help collect steelhead for three years, um, which really inflated my catch, uh, but nevertheless provides an interesting comparison because the numbers are similar between uh, uh, Ralph Wall and myself. He spent far less time fishing. He only fished on weekends at best, early in the year because of his department store, because I grew up also in a men's clothing store, uh, working since I was the age of 11. I know what the pattern of business is, and no businessman can make it by fishing weekends during the um, Christmas period because your majority of the money that you make is uh, during the Christmas time period. So he spent very little time in December fishing. I spent a lot of time in December and January fishing. So the results, 19% of my catch is early, 81% late, Summer run steelhead, a bare remnant, 5%. Winter run, 95%. So we've got a lot of vacant area in here. This is what we're left with. A lot of period of time where we as fishermen cannot experience steelhead anymore, wild steelhead. Chambers Creek hatchery steelhead consequences to wild. Early return, wild steelhead have greatly diminished due to the unavoidable need to heavily harvest Chambers Creek hatchery steelhead to prevent increased spawning in the wild. A shift to later run timing has resulted for wild steelhead. Loss of early wild steelhead leaves formerly productive habitat diminished of escapement that only early return time can fill. Increasing domestication of Chambers Creek hatchery steelhead has resulted in their diminishing survival, diminishing returns, diminishing harvest, and incapacity to persist over time. And this is passed to the wild populations by those that do survive to spawn in the wild. All in all, pretty much a lose-lose situation for us. Okay, let's look at the rest of the world. Green River. Look familiar? Puyallup River, look familiar? Quileute, well this looks a little different. How do we interpret this? Well, let's break it up into components. Let's look at the most recent history of when the steelhead numbers started to really, hatchery steelhead numbers started to increase in the Quileute Basin was here. All of a sudden we're back into the same pattern. Increasing smolts, less harvest. Uh, yeah, this is total harvest again, both hatchery and wild, both tribal and sport. This despite the fact that uh, habitat is uh, not nearly the uh, probable limiting factor on the west side of the Olympic Peninsula as may be the case in certain areas of Puget Sound. Queets. Well, how do we interpret this one? It's kind of weird to look at as well because the hatchery program didn't start till quite late. Might look here what some of the tribal harvest was back in this period of time on the Queets. All wild fish. 
So let's look at uh, when the hatchery program, what the consequences have been in the cleats. There's the harvest. There's the small plants. Same old story. Quinault. Remember the Queets in particular is uh, the great majority of the Queets River is in Olympic National Park or within uh, uh, Olympic Park control within the watershed area. Quinault River is similar, either that uh, or uh, Quinault Indian Nation land. So habitat again is not a big issue, except Quinault Indian land has been heavily logged. But again, it's hard to analyze this one because the hatchery program didn't start till late. The hatchery program did indeed result in initial higher harvest. Let's look at the trend. This is after the hatchery plants increased. Here's harvest going down. Hatchery plants going up. What we're looking at is a backward point in time in that if we extend this out into the future, the quinault, the quits are both going to look just like Puget Sound, despite the fact that the majority of their watersheds are Olympic Park. Habitat's not the problem. Something else is going on. This is a prime suspect. So let's River of Oregon. Sport harvest, Sletz River, hatchery history. At this point, they reacted. Oh my God, this is going not where we want it to go. So they started a wild broodstock program. Well, like most early hatchery programs, things are not looking that bad yet, but it's certainly not providing what it historically did. Salmonberry River of the Oregon coast, Nehalem, uh, Norfolk, Nehalem tributary. This is uh, reds per kilometer uh, in the Salmonberry Basin. Salmonberry Basin uh, has the highest uh, wild steelhead reds per kilometer in Western Oregon. No hatchery plants. Kind of looks like Norfolk Umpqua, huh? 29 year wild summer steelhead escapement trend past Powerdale Dam on the Hood River. This is where um, all of the really interesting, or a lot of the really interesting hatchery wild steelhead studies have occurred over the past 10 years. It's been the Hood River Basin, pretty well documenting the um, devastating consequences of productivity due to hatchery rearing. Hood River not necessarily increased hatchery plants for summer run steelhead, just sustained Interestingly, in the Hood River, they tried domesticated broodstock, and then they've tried wild broodstock. Essentially, same results. Hatchery smolt program was terminated. We won't have any results on Hood River for quite some time yet to know otherwise. And with removal of Powerdale Dam, we won't really ha be able to monitor it in exactly the same way because removable, removal of Powerdale Dam occurred at this point as well. Here's the wild winter steelhead trends in the Hood River. Same story, except it was increasing hatchery plants. Same thing, in this case, this was um, domesticated broodstock. Here's wild broodstock. They tried them both. Same long-term trend, more you plant, less you come back for wild steel. Let's go to northern, let's go to Vancouver Island. East coast of Vancouver Island, kind of the classic monitoring case of uh, the longest period of, of careful monitoring of steelhead populations that maybe has occurred anywhere on the coast. Uh, 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 Keel Rivers in British Columbia, north end of Vancouver Island, northeast end supposedly in the same area where um, uh, uh, going into jo Johnston Strait and then Georgia Strait between Vancouver Island, the mainland, which connects with Puget Sound, which supposedly has uh, some sort of weird ocean conditions going on that's really limiting what's going on with uh, steelhead in Georgia Strait and Puget Sound. So the Keel River is an interesting one because they tried several different approaches Keel was heavily logged back in here, a lot of habitat degradation as a result. 
uh, a, a weir was eventually put in on it, and uh, this is the sport uh, hatchery program was initiated here. Uh, what's interesting about this, you can see that the black bars are hatchery release, uh, gray bar wild release, uh, and the darker gray bar wild harvest, and the white bar is hatchery harvest. I don't know what's going on with British Columbia folks, but I think we have the same thing sometimes going on here, but they're not keeping very many hatchery fish. They're releasing them. So you're flooding the wild population with hatchery fish, so they'll interbreed with them. So it's not too surprising what happened. Um, nevertheless, they stopped plants, didn't rebound much, so let's try it again. Well, nothing much happened either. Well, let's try uh, captive broodstock. This is wild broodstock, this is wild broodstock, and this is captive broodstock. Well, actually fishing is closed most of the time through here because of the great failure that's occurred on the keel. Let's look at the weir counts. This is the actual numbers of fish that are re going past the weir. Pretty much the same trend as the, as the catch trends. Big bump right in here where throughout the coast we had in the 1980s a period of time of high productivity. Hatchery fish often do pretty well during that period. And uh, then things kind of go to hell in a handbasket when the ocean conditions go bad. And things have been limping along after that since, after they discontinued the hatchery plants. Then they ramped them up a little uh, again right here, try it once more with wild broodstock. And then the captive broodstock, yeah, there's a little bump up, but they also were having a lot of residualism. In other words, captive broodstock fish didn't really want to go out, and that's pretty explainable. They're captive broodstock. Why would they want to go out? So there's a mixed message that comes out of uh, the east coast of Vancouver Island. It's the Adam and Eve River. The Adam and Eve River has had no hatchery history, is uh, only geographically in quite close proximity to the Keogh, no hatchery plants, not nearly the devastating trend as has occurred with the keel. Still going into um, the Johnston Strait, Georgia Strait area that's supposedly limiting our ability to bring back steelhead. This is sort of the, the gold standard of monitoring in British Columbia for the east coast of Vancouver Island are the Tasitica River, northeast Vancouver Island, wild summer steelhead snorkel count surveys that have gone on for this period of time. Pretty level. It's going down a little bit, but uh, on the whole, we're seeing an increasing trend here. If we look at a few mirrors more, maybe dead level. This is the uh, same, same trend. This is the same geographic areas to Keogh and the Adam and Eve. Also, the Sitka River in this point in time here had very heavy harvest impacts of uh, uh, timber harvest. Quinsome River of East Vancouver Island, tributary of Hag Brown's Campbell. He would be turning in his grave. Um, the Quinsome uh, has had a very heavy hatchery history. And this is angler catch, and as well as catch release and harvest. Again, the 80s, a pretty good bump. And decline to the point well, there's no fishing. Many, a, a good number of years in here, there's no fishing at all, total closures. And after here, I've since found out as the program was terminated, hatchery program, Quinson. So let's go to the lower Fraser River system, which is pretty close proximity to the Skagit and Nooksack. We'd anticipate probably pretty similar trends, maybe. Uh, also goes into uh, uh, Georgia Strait. The gold standard, like the Tsitsika was for East Coast Vancouver Island, the gold standard for data collection in the lower Fraser is the Coquihalla River. The Coquihalla uh, is summer run steelhead, is what they monitor through snorkel surveys. They tried a mixture of alternatives of hatchery programs from fry plants to par plants to smoke plants. None of them seemed to result in anything uh, very dramatic without a consequence that occurred thereafter. Uh, as a result, 
in uh, uh, 2004, they uh, terminated the hatchery plants. And since that period, it's been in a very positive response. Okay, let's look at um, places where hatchery plants have stopped elsewhere in the world. Scotland's River Tweed, Wild Atlantic Salmon Recovery after hatchery closure in 1974. Here's what happened during their hatchery program, provided some harvest early on, then things kind of weren't doing that good. Stop the program, zoom. These are primarily harvested fish in Scotland. Oregon coast, Alcea River, adult coho, spawner estimates. Alcea River is, has been noted for a long time as the center of uh, the Oregon coast hatchery world. Um, it is no more. Uh, and back here in 1998, the hatchery program for coho was terminated after there was a threatened listing by NOAA of the coho returns in the Oregon coast. Here's the response after the coho hatchery program was terminated of wild coho since. Here's the Oregon coast. Not all hatchery programs were ter terminated in 1998, but quite a few were. Again, same increase. What caused this on the Oregon coast? It was identified the hatchery smolt releases of coho were attracting huge numbers of predators, sea lions, seals, and birds in particular. They were attracted to hatchery reared fish that haven't a clue how to survive in the wild or how to evade predation, and wild fish are mixed right in with them. So you've got a mixed predator fishery, and the wild fish suffered dramatically. Get rid of the hatchery fish, wild fish know how to escape predators pretty well and they're not mixed up with that hatchery tangle. Here's the Salmon River of the Oregon coast, wild coho recovery progress. Hatchery plants ceased here since, same trend. Here's the big one. This is probably the biggest story on the west coast. Osoyoos Lake wild sockeye salmon. Nine, above nine dams on the main stem Columbia River. Above nine dams. We're talking about fish that average four pounds in weight, little critters. Here's the history of Osoyoos, Okanagan, Sockeye in the red bars. And here's Lake Wenatchee, which has remained uh, hatchery planted, hatchery supplemented throughout the same period of time. Here, there was a hatchery program initiated at Osoyoos Lake. Subsequently, wasn't bringing much back, so it was terminated. 1999, a habitat evaluation occurred, very thorough one. It was realized that it needed, number one, far more escapement to fill the spawning grounds and to fill the rearing area of the lake and the Lake Osoyoos. At this point, the fish and water management tool was deployed, which altered the flows in the Okanagan River for more, um, uh, uh, for better spawning conditions and for um, uh, egg to uh, fry survival by keeping water in the Okanagan River where they spawn. And the fish management tool also increased flows uh, with agreements by using mitigation money instead of for hatchery programs to instead invest the money in habitat improvements and to address the limitations, the actual limitations of Osoyoos Lake rather than put a Band-Aid on it. And by addressing the limitations of Osoyoos Lake by providing sufficient <coughs> Uh, water circulation during summer months with the increased flows from the ir irrigation dams into the lake, the number of, of smolts produced from the lake skyrocketed. And here was the wild Osoyoos response. There was also a, a um, hatchery program started at Skaha Lake of the Okanagan system just upstream after uh, passage was provided past um, one of the irrigation dams at Skaha Lake. Uh, uh, it has not been nearly the same productivity of hatchery introduction in the Skaha as the wild productivity. And so these returns here are 85 to 90 percent wild depending on the year. Meantime, Wenatchee, 
What happened? Folks began to realize maybe science does have something to tell us. And in Lake Wenatchee, last year, sockeye smoke plants stopped for sockeye. And the reason? They found that 95% of the sport harvest was wild sockeye, not hatchery. Why continue the millions of dollars spent for a hatchery program that brings back nothing? Where sound science prevails, there can be large results. Skagit's no different. I'm open to any questions. <laughs>